This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Robert Gallucci, who is the president of the MacArthur Foundation. Bob, welcome back to Berkeley and to the program. Thank you, Harry. It's a pleasure to be with you. So tell us about your new job as president of the MacArthur Foundation, or at least your, this is your third year into this new position. Uh, what, what is entailed in that role? What, what, what are the, the skills required and, and the tasks that you have to undertake? I think the most important thing for a foundation like MacArthur, and there are a number of uh, big American foundations with significant endowments and therefore a significant amount of money that they give away every year, is to do it wisely. Uh, the first thing I'm going to focus on here is uh, the obligation any of us have that run a, one of these foundations to, in a sense, justify the decision of the American people through the United States Congress, which grants the exemption from tax for the purpose of allowing a foundation to accomplish charitable purposes. And so the first thing, uh, the first obligation is to make good on that essentially act of faith that we will do good things with this money. And I think beyond doing good things that for many of us it means doing strategic things. Uh, and so what I'm getting to here is what most foundations, including MacArthur, try to do and that is to use the money we have and for us it means around two hundred million dollars a year we expend in grants to mostly to non-governmental organizations, sometimes other entities, but mostly NGOs, and try to do, have an impact in some areas, but an impact that's outsized, where we have leveraged in some way the amount of money that we've given to some set of groups to accomplish some objective. So it's strategic in that sense. It is not, and this is a contrast, simply trying to help a particular set of people. I mean, if one went into uh, depressed areas of the United States or of Africa or somewhere else in the what we used to call the third world, one could give money to people to feed them. If one was only doing that, we would say, well, that, that's not a good use of our money. Maybe that's a good use of governmental aid money, but not for us. We don't have that much. As, uh, well, I think $200 million to go to try to do good with is a substantial amount of money. It is not substantial in terms of the amounts of money that are expended by governments in their aid programs and certainly in the private sector there are opportunities uh, to do an awful lot of good that's separate from philanthropy so the obligation this is a roundabout way of getting to your question the obligation of someone who runs a foundation is to figure out what's the proper place for us where should we stand on which issues try to accomplish what and how. How do we use those resources to get the change, the impact on the human condition? It may be reducing the number of women who die in childbirth, maternal mortality. It may be reducing the risk of nuclear war. It may be housing in South Chicago. It may be sustaining the arts uh, as another definition of improving the human condition. We, we worry, for example, about juvenile justice and reforming that system. So wherever we decide we're going to work, we're looking for a strategic approach, designing one, looking for leverage, looking for substantial change so that at the end of the day, 
my colleagues and I can go home and say we did right by the confidence that was placed in us by the American people. Uh, your, your career, which we discussed in our first interview, is, is one 20 years of uh, distinguished government service, then you were an academic and a dean. How, how did your past experience inform your work today? Did, did it give you a body of experience that uh, uh, enabled you to, to sort of meet the challenges uh, of fulfilling this mission you just described? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, substantively, I can't say that uh, my career in academia, or certainly not government service, uh, prepares one for the substantive menu that we have at the MacArthur Foundation, which is to say that we are in maybe 15 or so different areas of work in internationally and domestically in a certain set in the city of Chicago where we live. One of those areas is the area that I worked on through most of my government service, the area of nuclear proliferation, reducing the risk of war, military operations, etc. We do have an international security area of work at the foundation, but it is one piece. It's one of as I say, 15 or 16 areas. So I wouldn't say I was substantively prepared. Um, I was no expert in housing, still am not. I was no expert on international health issues, still am not. I'm learning. The whole area of environment, I can, I can go through these areas, K through 12 education, and um, I'd say, unfortunately, after each area, that's not an area of expertise for me. So I like to think what I bring to the job is a, an analytical approach uh, to complex problems. Uh, as a colleague of mine once pointed out, all the senior positions in government and the private sector and elsewhere almost always involve making decisions under situations of uncertainty and trying to figure out how to frame an issue, how to pull it apart how to look for a strategic approach, how to weigh the costs and the risks, and then make a rational judgment. That sounds w way more rational than any human being really is, but it's what we try for, I think. And I have a fair amount of experience with complex problems uh, from government service, and I worked on Middle East peace issues, Northeast Asian peace issues, European peace issues, very complicated political terms, economic terms, bureaucratic terms back home. Georgetown University being a dean meant an undergraduate program and a graduate program and having faculty and having alumni and having administration. And academic politics. And <laughs> academic pol I, I guess there were some academic <laughs> politics, yes, now that you mention it, Harry. Uh, so th those complexities are uh, things that you have to deal with in, uh, in whether you're a government uh, a public servant as I was uh, in government service, we are in academia as a dean, staff to faculty is how I would put it. So I'm in, a, in an environment in which the issues are very complicated. Uh, we struggle uh, really very hard with strategies to figure out how in fact we can address the quest a question like uh, the impact of climate change in a place where there's great endemism like Madagascar. What, what should we be doing there to preserve species? Because Biodiversity, species preservation is a big part of that particular area of work. That's very complicated in a technical sense, and then as soon as you figure out some of the dynamics technically, you're into the world of politics and what's possible, what kind of intervention, where, where can we make our move and, and have an impact. So having thought about complex problems before, I think I bring that kind of ability, and then hopefully all of us as we get older, and I have done that, uh, I, I, I think we learn more about how to relate to people and maybe get the best out of them. I I'm spend a lot of time thinking about how to motivate the people who I work with uh, so that they will be uh, happy warriors on the, on the programs that we work on. They'll approach these, these things intellectually aggressively and not be passive. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer that these are difficult problems and we, they need to be attacked. Uh, in, in your government service, uh, you, uh, you, it, 
you often were sort of present at the creation of new undertakings, thinking of the Sinai disengagement force, the monitoring of uh, the Iraq uh, weapons after the first Gulf War, the uh, uh, negotiations with North Korea. And, and uh, uh, it, it strikes me that in the role that you're describing, you, you, you again are, don't have a template sometimes, or if there is a template, you have to ask yourself, are, are there new ideas or new institutions that can shake up the ongoing template? Talk a little about that. I always enjoyed what I would call, for lack of a better analytical term, startups. Mm -hmm. uh, startups require you typically to originate the strategy. You're not walking into a situation in which the strategy is there and you are implementing it. You have to figure out what are the moving parts that matter. You have to, in fact, be pretty crisp about your goals and objectives. You have to do assessments about costs and risks, costs being things you're going to pay to get something done, risks being things you hope not to pay but you may have to. Uh, so you, there's a lot that goes into a startup. Uh, personnel as a whole, you're, you're recruiting people to your enterprise. Uh, and as you're going along, typically in a startup, you're selling it because there's al almost always, I'm not, I don't think I can think of an exception, there is some audience uh, whose support you need, maybe several. Uh, when I was in government, it was always the Hill. Uh, after one sold it within the bureaucracy, the interagency, yes, uh, we're going to do an agreement at Dayton and we will implement it. Yes, we're, we are going to do inspections in Iraq. Uh, yes, uh, we are going to have a deal with North Korea and set up an organization called Keto. All these things, each of them required a lot of work with your colleagues, with my colleagues in the bureaucracy, but then selling it to the United States Congress and then doing press to sell it to the American people. So that, that model, I went to Georgetown and initially it wasn't, and Georgetown was not a startup, it, it had a, a dean who preceded me, he was dean for 25 years, it's a very successful school. But uh, something happened right in the middle of it, and that was the opportunity to open a branch in Qatar, in Doha. Mm -hmm. And that was a startup again. With all those problems, with all persuading people this was the right thing to do, a Catholic Jesuit institution in a Wahhabi Sunni uh, society. It, and it was a wonderful challenge, and I think now a, a great success. Coming to the foundation um, the, uh, is the opportunity to have startups many times. Because uh, every time you think about a new area of work, you have to start conceptualizing it, as I described. What are we going to try to accomplish? What's right for us? What will be the strategy? What, where will we make our impact? Who do we need to partner with in the private sector or with government? All those framing questions to get that right. And then, of course, I report to a board, uh, a small board, but a smart board, uh, that's, that is capable of being very critical, as they should be, and fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities. So I know that I have to put something in place and sell it to a board. If I next, for example, thought I, I might want to um, address the problem of mass incarceration in the United States. I, I use that as an example because I'm, we're thinking about it right now. Um, much too big. Uh, there are many things wrong with this horrendous things wrong with this. I'm persuaded it's a, it's a major question mm -hmm. for the United States of America. Uh, and so as we grapple with that, that would be a startup of some significant magnitude uh, for us, requiring great investments of people's time and foundation uh, resources. So it is what I've done before. It is exciting to me. Uh, I want to stay with programs as long as they're productive. Uh, but as soon as we think a program should be wound down, we want to make sure the resources that went into that program are channeled someplace else where we've already been doing some of the spade work and the groundwork. So we transition smoothly to another area of work. Uh, in, in, again, in looking back at the previous interview, uh, uh, I noticed that again and again you would, when you were doing one of these startups, you would look for uh, the best uh, expertise on the matter. You know, what do we already know? Uh, as I look at the MacArthur website, it's very clear that, that you're nurturing and fostering institutions, but, but you're, you're just not trying to do this from the top down. You're actually exploring uh, the various environments 
to see how ideas and institution can percolate up from the bottom. Talk a little about that, because that, that would see, seem to be a very difficult task to navigate. So I think that we do something like what you just described in a couple of different ways. One way is if we're, <coughs> excuse me, exploring an area, um, for example, the a aging society in the United States, or uh, the impact of digital media on learning, or if we decide to do it, uh, the, the mass incarceration issue, we will bring um, experts together. Uh, we will do convenings, um, and we'll have the, all the staff present, even as we have the experts around the table. The staff will be at the table and is backbenching, and we will try uh, to get from experts insights that will help us figure out whether we want to pursue an area, and if so, how. We will eventually maybe turn some of those convenings into standing sort of working groups that will uh, be networks uh, that will promote publications and the sharing of insights in this area. Uh, and we think that is one way of getting the word out. It's quite, if I can use this phrase, upstream from a policy implication. It's the intellectual part of the work, but still very important. So we think that <coughs> um, creates uh, a informed uh, discussion of the issue and important venues, both political venues and academic venues, intellectual venues uh, for public intellectuals around the, around the country. So that, that is one way we do it. <clears throat> Within the foundation, I have very much wanted uh, to create an atmosphere of, uh, I would say, open and healthy criticism um, in which uh, this seminar is the model. My image of a successful seminar from my own academic work and then from my years at Georgetown is a place where uh, no one's status matters, full professor to graduate student doesn't matter. What matters is the quality of the intervention, the thought, the writing, and anybody's free to speak. Uh, so everybody is legitimate in that context. I would like that atmosphere at the foundation. We do need, it's a, it's a, it's a structured environment. I, I, you know, I'm a president, I have a vice president, there are program managers, program officers, all, and assistants, et cetera. That structure is there. But I don't want it to get in the way of the intellectual work. So I've been working hard to, uh, to try to create an environment in which uh, there are no stovepipes preventing cooperation, collegial exchanges, in which information is never hoarded and it's, there's transparency throughout. Transparency is a positive value and where everybody feels they can contribute. So for example, a, a new area of work is, um, and it's in a general area that, of media culture and new initiatives, is to encourage new initiatives within the foundation as well as trying to be aggressive about getting new ideas from outside the foundation. I want people to know who are working in the foundation, wherever they work, that if they have an idea, they've seen something, read something, and they would like to write it up and submit it as something that we should think about moving into exploring for possible funding, that they can do it. In other words, the, the, the line function of the foundation is open to not only the line officers who are the program officers, but to the staff. Uh, and if people think that way, m the feeling I have is that we will be a more agile organization uh, we'll always be aiming for quality uh, and we'll always have some structure because people need to report to other people and be responsible, et cetera. But intellectually, I think it'll be a more vibrant place, and, I, and that's important. Mm -hmm. in, in your work, I guess you uh, travel a lot, and, and how does that experience, that is, of going to Madagascar, going to uh, the Antarctic, how, how does that elevate your consciousness beyond uh, just reading the reports, assembling the academics, and having all this uh, criticism in a seminar? I was uh, worked for the U.S. government for over 20 years, and then I spent another 13 years as a dean at Georgetown. 
And in both of those jobs, I traveled a lot. I came to MacArthur expecting to travel a lot. Uh, I expected that I would get more out of the travel if I was thoroughly briefed, if I read as much as I could uh, and went out knowing as much as I could, but expecting that I would still learn things I couldn't possibly learn sitting in my very nice office in Chicago. Uh, if I wanted to understand uh, what we were doing in Russia, I needed to go to our offices in Moscow and then get out and see the grantees, the people we give and support, we give funds to and support, and see what they're doing and listen to them, and then see the best case that can be made for our continued funding, and where the case isn't good enough to act on that information. Uh, it is uh, maybe my favorite story to talk about one area of work where I had, A, not any background and, and no experience, whatever, and became for me uh, maybe my emotionally favorite area of work, and that's uh, juvenile justice reform. That did not happen by reading the papers on juvenile mm -hmm. justice reform. When I, my staff, my loyal staff, sent me to New Orleans uh, for a day in the prison and then a day in the jails, uh, spending time with the judges who do juvenile cases, the prosecutors, uh, the police, uh, spending time most important with the kids in those two places. And they are kids. This is juvenile justice. You know, nobody's over 17. Uh, I was persuaded, A, that there was an awful lot of work to be done in this area, that we were doing good work, and I began to understand what the strategy meant and the way it was working. Um, and then I subsequently did comparable, similar things in Philadelphia and in Chicago. Uh, and I, I, I don't believe it's possible to sort of get it on issues like that without seeing it. Um, and I, the environmental work, similarly. Um, the, you know, my trips to Madagascar, where there's incredible um, endemism. Species are unique to Madagascar going to the Antarctic and seeing uh, the stark reality of what's happening there and, and seeing it manifest in, in front of one species actually being put at risk. Uh, or seeing the analytical similarity, oddly, uh, of what we're trying to do or what are the NGOs we're supporting in Ecuador are trying to do to build among the native Indian population in Ecuador an appreciation for their rights under Ecuador's laws to protect their environment. Uh, and the, sort of the community building is remarkably similar to what we are trying to do in South Chicago in neighborhoods to build communities to work on a number of pieces of their lives, of the people in these communities' lives at one time. The education of the kids, getting people to work, getting businesses to come in. There are similarities in community mm. development and the implications of building a com community for the quality of life of the people who live there. I don't understand how I would understand this uh, without actually going and witnessing it. So I'm a, I'm a believer in that. It takes time. It's time away from the foundation. Um, there's no free lunch, but I think it's important. Uh, this raises an interesting question, which is we're, we're looking at a world now where uh, American, is, the United States is still preeminent in power terms, but there's some kind of relative decline going on. I'm, I'm curious, uh, are you finding, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, all the ideas would be flowing from the center, namely the United States, you know, out to the provinces. Are you seeing in these different areas the, the, uh, uh, the emerging of ideas in other places, not just the impoverished, but you know, in emerging economies and so on, so that the the transmission of ideas is going the other way now. I don't know that uh, you introduced the question, Harry, with uh, with almost a decline of America proposition. Relative, and relative. I'm a student of Waltz. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, I I don't know uh, what what the uh, environment we're living in means about uh, America's place, um, relative place, to where many of us thought it was before. I, uh, I want to say a word about that, then I'll try to go directly yeah. to your question. I think there's a, a, 
that the United States is still the essential player in so many areas that I'm interested in anyway that go to the human condition. It's very difficult to imagine a successful strategy, uh, energy strategy that addresses climate change in which we are not an important player. Notwithstanding China's importance, India's importance, that where we go still matters so much. Um, decisions we make about nuclear energy, what kind of fuels, et cetera, decisions we make about use of coal, not use, these are, this is all, ex I think, extremely important to the world. Uh, our economic power still is extraordinary, even in, in, as we look ahead and the, the challenges we have. Our military power, our capacity to project force with lethality and precision. So there's an awful lot one can point to, um, and probably uh, more than anything else, the American creativity, uh, that we still are the source of uh, much of the creativ creativity in the world, notwithstanding what globalization has meant, notwithstanding the rise of very significant other powers in the world. So I, I would uh, uh, caution uh, against uh, any proposition that began with uh, decline as the uh, essential phenomenon. I don't, I don't think that's right. Not that it's impossible, but I don't think it, it captures our situation now. With respect to um, the flow of ideas. Uh, I, I, I think we, one of the things that's happened with the world we live in and, and the information technology revolution is I don't think we have the expectation that we're going to arrive somewhere with an answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, so I, it's a different, uh, the expectation isn't there. So if we are looking at uh, maternal mortality and ways of impacting it, the first thing we do is we try to understand what people are doing in, in that culture about this and what we can understand from how other people have addressed it. Everybody's looking for best practices. Everybody's trying to understand what's out there. And what's out there is no, we no longer think of the United States as the universe. It's a global situation. And, and information technology has made that a, a reality. It's not just a phrase that we use. Uh, and I, I think that uh, more and more we will see a world in which solutions truly are global in their, in their sources. And, but we won't be remarkable, remarking on it. I don't think it'll be extraordinary. I don't think it is now. I, for example, in the cases that I, where I was talking about interventions that we might contemplate from the foundation, uh, we're not very often delivering them at all. Uh, we may help promote them, mm -hmm. uh, but they can come from almost anywhere. And the NGOs sometimes are, are from all over the, the globe. So I, I think there's uh, less of a... Uh, uh, American-centric approach to the world than maybe people might think. Uh, a problem that you worked on uh, throughout your career in the government and in the university was the problem of proliferation. And uh, MacArthur uh, has uh, recently uh, started some initiatives on that. What, what do you see as the, the three main problems in uh, the proliferation uh, area? So, well, I should say the nuclear weapon, nuclear power. Yeah. The uh, my uh, focus in this area has, when I in, at MacArthur, reflected what I was focusing on when I was in government and when I was writing when I moved to academia. Uh, I am at least partially consumed by the threat, which I see as real of a nuclear terrorist attack on the United States or one of our allies. I, I do not find this the stuff of fiction. I mean, it is. I, don't, I, mean, I should say I do not find this only the stuff of fiction. Um, I, it is one of the only areas, oddly enough, at the foundation where I, I regard myself as having real expertise based upon years of trying to study it and understand it. Uh, and I think the, the risk here uh, is that the world uh, will fail at securing fissile material, the material that you use to make a bomb, either highly enriched uranium or plutonium. And um, a terrorist group will get their hands on it. 
what I'd like to persuade people of typically, if I have an opportunity to speak to them, is that once they have the fissile material, uh, the rest of the steps to get to the detonation of a nuclear explosive device in an American city um, are not overwhelmingly challenging. Uh, the design of an explosive device, the manufacture, the engineering of the explosive device, the delivery of the explosive device, none of those are overwhelmingly difficult anymore. They're just not. What, what, they're not easy, but they're, they're does not require um, real genius. It doesn't require people who have experience with nuclear weapons. It requires people with technical knowledge and skills, certainly, but, but not more than that. The, the kind of things that sophisticated terrorist groups might have, in other words. The key is fissile material, mm -hmm. and that's pretty hard to come by still. Uh, and if you ask where would I focus our energies in the area of nuclear weapons, nuclear security, it is on making sure that we control the fissile material we have to the highest standard, that we destroy what we have as quickly as possible, and we stop producing any more. When you're in a hole, first stop digging. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't need plutonium for anything. And we don't need highly enriched uranium for anything. I know that may strike some people as odd, and some people may wish to argue with me, but I would say the, the plutonium, which is produced by extracting it from spent nuclear fuel, one doesn't need that to power reactors. Uranium will do quite well. We have a lot of it. We can enrich it a little bit. You don't need plutonium for anything, I would argue. Just dispose of it. Get rid of it. Highly enriched uranium, you don't need it to run reactors. We use it to run naval reactors. We have a lot of it st stored, and we can do what others do and redesign the reactor so that it'll run on low enriched uranium if we should run out of those stores. So what I'm saying is the one thing I'm most worried about turns on fissile material, and we, the world, could actually get rid of it. That is not where we're headed at the moment. Yeah. Where we're headed is to the accumulation of more. The Chinese, if the Chinese adopt plutonium fuels, Katie, bar the door. So um, our focus at, at MacArthur has been very much on this, the study of the nuclear fuel cycles, choice of fuels. We're not anti-nuclear, but we certainly are anti-fissile material as, as fuel. And I would like other people to look at the risks associated here and uh, make a decision, just as you would on safety grounds, that this particular design is not safe. Well, this particular fuel is not is not consistent with good security. So that's, that's really the, the thrust. So, so uh, you have a graphic image, when, uh, which I remember from when you came to lecture to my class a few years back, and that is a, a, a soccer ball, uh, a, a fissile, fissile material the size of a soccer ball could uh, essentially be transported across a border uh, and turned into a dirty Bomb. I mean, that is that is that help us understand the problem you're identifying. Okay, so if we were talking about plutonium, a baseball would be a better image. Mm. And my concern is that one or more baseballs of plutonium will come out of North Korea if they decide to transfer, or Pakistan if it leaks, they fail to control it that will get into the hands of a group who will make an explosive device. That device does not have to be very large. It will be not too hard to transport it. If you think you'll catch it at the American border, I would advise everybody to think about the borders again and how easy it is to get a bale of marijuana into the United States. Think about the marinas, constantly patrolled by the Coast Guard. No, they're not. The marinas that are quite open, eat quite penetrable. So any strategy that's going to save New York, Washington, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, whatever your greatest fear is, whatever strategy you have, if, it, if the strategy requires us catching the bad guys delivering it, that's a loser's game. That is a bad strategy. 
your strategy, you know, is to pray that they won't be able to figure out what to do with the material, that's not good. I, 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 I'm here to tell you that the difficulty is not that overwhelming to produce real yield. And by the way, I am not talking about a dirty bomb. Dirty bomb in the biz, as they say, is sometimes called a, an RDD, a radiation dispersal device. Usually the scenario when we talk about that, that RDD or dirty bomb doesn't kill that many people. It's pretty damn inconvenient and scares people, makes an area not usable for a while, but it is not nuclear yield. It's not an explosive. I'm talking about yield. And if you have in mind the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs that destroyed those two cities, the Hiroshima bomb um, was mm, 10 or 12,000 tons of TNT equivalent or kilotons. The Nagasaki bomb may be 15 or 16 KT kilotons equivalent. And we're talking about prompt deaths, people who died with, within hours of the detonation of in the 100,000 range. So an American city ground burst device, if it, was, if it was to have that kind of yield of the Hiroshima device, uh, pro you'd expect probably more than that. And with radiation deaths much higher because it would be ground burst and the fireball would pick up and, and make a lot of material radioactive and a lot of people comparably to the prompt deaths would occur a, a lot of people would die in the, in the next four to six weeks. So we're talking about an awful lot of Americans being killed by, by an amount of material about the size of a baseball. Highly enriched uranium it takes some more material. There are issues about how it would be designed. Would it be an implosion device or a gun type device? And we could talk about all that, but that's right now for me largely in the noise. If the, if the proposition is accepted that these can be built uh, I would suggest to you they can be delivered and they can be detonated. And what has kept this from happening, because a lot of people feel, well, it hasn't happened, so it won't. That kind of thinking troubles me greatly, and I don't think people in government service, for example, who have a responsibility to protect the, gov the country can afford to think that way. It hasn't happened, but it might. And I think over time, if the materials availability situation changes, uh, or doesn't get better, I fear it will happen. So, so you're arguing that there is a group of former national security advisors who want to go to zero with regard to nuclear weapons, but the idea that's germinating with you and at the foundation is zero, uh, an effort to, to move toward uh, uh, zero fissile material. Precisely, absolutely precisely. Now, you were a student of, of uh, international politics, and you, I, I don't need, and you know the, 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 the international anarchy that we, we've lived in and the, the struggle for prestige and power. How do you interface this idea with that reality of, of the world? Uh, Harry, as you know, the four gentlemen, sometimes called the four horsemen, who advocated uh, going to uh, zero nuclear weapons. That's an aspiration and a target, and it's something that presidents are prepared to say we're aiming for. And if we are aggressive about reducing numbers of weapons, I think that will be good. And indeed, I think uh, one of the areas of study for the foundation is how do you maintain security in a world in which deterrence has been important as the numbers of weapons get smaller, particularly if you have new entrants into the field. Uh, the India, the Pakistan, the North Korea, maybe the Iran at some point. Um, how do we reconcile the reduction in, in the stockpiles of the two major weapons holders, Russia and the United States, with rising powers? How do we think about maintaining uh, a secure second strike capability, as it's called, or a secure deterrent? So I think all that's very interesting and ought to be addressed. Um, in the context, as you said, of uh, one who's realistic about international politics. What I'm talking about is focusing on fissile material first that is not wrapped up in weapons. Getting the material out of weapons would be very nice in destroying it. But long before I got there, I would like to mm. address the stockpiles. And there are about, um, I don't know, something on the order of 2,000 tons 
of fissile material out there in the um, stockpiles of countries. It's in weapons areas, it's in uh, civilian energy areas, it's in research areas. Uh, there's a lot of separated plutonium from reprocessing facilities where countries say, well, we're going to recycle it into the current generation of reactors, sometimes called thermal reactors, or we're saving it for the next generation of reactors called fast reactors. Um, I would argue neither of those are necessary or desirable. Destroy the plutonium, either burning it or by treating it as waste. So I want to get at the material where it's accessible. The last place I would go, and because it's the hardest, as you were suggesting, is to say, okay, now we have to dismantle our nuclear weapons. Along the way, we, we would be doing a lot more good, I think, for the concern I've been describing, namely the nuclear terrorism concern, if we got at the stockpiles of fissile material. We have uh, three problems, uh, countries confronting us with regard to proliferation now. Uh, Iran, we have Pakistan, uh, and uh, uh, we, we... North Korea. Hit, North Korea. So, so the, the, the issue, let, let's talk a little about what role can negotiations successfully play and what kind of negotiations to get these actors uh, to, to change their behavior uh, in light of a non-proliferation regime? These are uh, the three current cases that you've pointed to, um, and they're all different. Having some similarities, they're all different. The dynamics are different. One way in which they're different is two of the countries have nuclear weapons, North Korea and Pakistan. One does not yet, Iran. In ascending order of difficulty, the North Korea case is, of the three, the easiest, from my perspective, to sort out. Uh, maybe it's because um, a long time ago I negotiated a deal with North Korea, which it seems to me could be negotiated again. That's precisely what bothers some people. They ask, how many times would you buy this horse? Mm -hmm. And I suggest they think about renting the horse rather than buying it. <laughs> that they understand that uh, what we're trying to do uh, is deal with the threat. Uh, if we could remove the threat entirely, I think that would be a good thing to do. I don't think at any price. In other words, I wasn't for striking North Korea. I'm not for striking North Korea now. I'm for negotiating with North Korea. I'm not for simply containing North Korea, which amounts to saying, I hope nothing bad happens and walking away. Something bad happened. North Korea tested nuclear explosive devices. They've been building missiles with increasing range, slowly to be sure. But the very worst thing the North Koreans did they did in 2007 when they built a plutonium production reactor in Syria. Sometimes when I'm talking to an audience, I say, repeat that, please. Mm -hmm. They built a plutonium production reactor. Sometimes when I talk about a baseball-sized amount of plutonium leaving North Korea, they say, is that plausible? Well, the North Koreans built, that's the third time I'm saying it, a plutonium production reactor in Syria, in the Middle East, in a country <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't particularly regarded as a peace-loving uh, regime uh, running that country. So, and now it's even worse. And yeah, now it's, it's even worse. worse. So uh, it's clear that the North Korean case does not get better if it's ignored. It needs to be engaged, and engagement has worked for a period of time from 1994 up until about 2003-ish. Um, it worked, uh, and okay, it stopped working. One could argue whose fault that was. The North Koreans cheated. They did. Uh, did we have to abandon the deal? Maybe, maybe not. Should we have negotiated a new deal? I think yes. Um, I, I am, in other words, not put off uh, from further negotiation, uh, even if I believed, and I do, that they cheated on the last one. I'll watch them as closely as I can, and I'll ask only one question. Are we better off? Is the national security served by that deal? Answer, yes. Then let's do it. This is not a schoolyard. I'm not trying to teach the North Koreans any lessons. 
I'm trying to stop a weapons program. I'm trying to stop them from doing very dangerous things elsewhere in the world. That's my answer on North Korea. The second one, Iran, probably more than anything else in the news these days, uh, talks uh, may bring us to a solution on Iran. I think it's important to understand that no matter what the Iranians say, they have a nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. That program is, goes back to the days of the Shah. And it is a reasonably robust one involving not only uranium enrichment through gas centrifuge, but also um, a heavy water production facility with the plans to build a heavy water moderated reactor. Because of the burn up of the fuel in such a reactor, it's ideal plutonium for the use in a nuclear weapons program. So they're doing what other countries have done, centrifuge for uranium, um, uh, some sort of natural uranium fueled reactor for plutonium. They have a very well developed program to design the triggering package for the nuclear explosive and they have been acquiring and uh, working on a ballistic missile delivery system for these weapons. So we should not have any ambiguity of what is there. The question is, have they made a decision that is non-reversible to proceed to produce fissile material and produce weapons? I don't know that they have. Uh, if they can still be dissuaded by the pain of sanctions um, or uh, incentivized uh, by uh, other uh, means which might be negotiated with them, uh, then I think that would be a wonderful outcome to this. Uh, I th it would be a wonderful outcome because we'd be avoiding uh, an Iran with nuclear weapons and we'd be avoiding the use of force to get there. I don't know that uh, I know what the American or the Israeli red lines are here. Uh, I suspect that if uh, Iran were ever to detonate a device, that would be a red line. I suspect that it's possible that if they were to discovered to have another secret site, that could be a red line. If they were discovered to be producing highly enriched uranium, uranium, let's say, over 85% in the isotope uranium-235, that could be a red line. Uh, and I hope the Iranians do none of those things. In the meantime, I hope uh, we keep trying negotiation. That's a far better way to deal with this. The, at the end of the day, the question has to be, are we better off if Iran pursues their weapons program, letting them have it and relying on deterrence? Mm -hmm. My concern is transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not making a case for any prescription right now other than sticking with the negotiations as long as they might work. But, I, but w one has to, I think, come to a decision in their own mind about what one would do in, at the end of the day if the negotiations fail. It's not a good idea to publicize what the answer to that is in your own mind, but it's, it, I think it, it behooves us to think that through. Before we talk about Pakistan, what, what is your judgment uh, about the, the way the set of negotiations with them uh, have become so pub, uh, politicized, so much in, in, out there in the public, uh, is is uh, a successful conclusion of negotiations where both sides have reached a mutual uh, agreement about their separate goals. Is that possible in this environment? It's, it's Harry. That's a great question because it's just very difficult. It's it's as someone once said, were there real negotiations with North Korea when we went, you know, to the six party talks? No serious, no serious negotiation takes place when there are 100 people in the room. And so when we negotiated the agreed framework, we did it bilaterally with North Korea. And the, some of the really tough stuff was done one-on-one -on -one with, I was the head negotiator with the North Korean head, head negotiator. In the Iranian case, there may be back channels working. Uh, and there may be, as it was suggested in the press, there may be uh, trial balloons both sides. I mean, the question here, what will the United States and the, and the, the, the P5 plus one plus Germany, what will they tolerate? 
in Iran? Will they accept the continuation of a, a centrifuge cascade producing uranium of enrichment less than 5 percent, for example? Will that be acceptable? Will they allow the Iranians and have a deal, in other words, allow the Iranians to keep a stockpile of 20 percent enriched uranium or not? Will they allow any enrichment? These are pretty important issues and as you say when it's a big public display like that then uh, particularly for the regime in Tehran this is a public issue this program is supported apparently as I say by most of the people in Iran I don't know that they understand mm -hmm. what the complaint of others is but that's a sovereign right they say to have this and they, they find the constant insistence of others to point to the Iranian failure to abide by its IAEA and therefore its NPT obligations as mere technicalities. They're not really technicalities. You, you worry, though, your primary, you, you, uh, an Iran with nuclear weapons, I gather you feel would be deterred, except you were concerned about this transfer of fissile material you know, sure. I, to, to put this in, in the starkest way, um, those who live in Israel now are within range of a missile that the Iranians call the Shahab-3. It's a medium-range ballistic missile. It is actually a North Korean no-dung modified with some assistance from Russia uh, some time ago. Uh, and if the Iranians figure out how to build nuclear weapons, if they decide they're going ahead and they do it, and they made it to the Shahab III, this will be, it'll put Israel at risk, Israel's survival at risk. Now, people in international relations have studied a, for a long time deterrence theory and what it takes to deter another country from attacking. One of the things it takes is uh, a mind that with, makes the same kind of calculations mm. that you would make or I would make. And, you or I would be deterred by the threat of annihilation in return. Uh, there's always the worry that there might be someone who is not so deterred, someone who values your death more than their life. Now, I think, generally speaking, deterrence works. It's, it, one never knows when it's working. One only knows when it fails. And in the, in, the, in the great battle between the Soviet Union and the United States of America those years, deterrence did not fail. Um, was it working? Well, one could make the argument. So when I'm, that's a long way of saying that it's a lot easier to uh, diminish the real threat of an Iran with nuclear weapons attacking another country that has nuclear weapons. That would be Israel or the United States or is under the American nuclear umbrella, de facto, if not de jure. Um, th it's easier if you are... 8,000 miles away. Um, I do worry more about, for the United States, I worry more about the transfer. I mean, if you ask an American in the business of security who supplies more conventional weapons to organizations Americans regard as terrorists than any other country on the planet, it would be Iran. We've seen transfers before in the case of North Korea. Uh, if Iran thought they could transfer material, and no one could attribute that material back to them, mm. would they risk it uh, in order to get real damage done to the United States, to Israel, to some other country? I, I don't think that is an obvious, uh, obviously easy question to answer. And it makes me focus as a trigger much more on the production of highly enriched uranium than on the production of weapons. I mean, that would precede the production of weapons. So for me, if I was ever going to intervene with force, I wouldn't wait for weapons tests or fabrication of weapons. Evidence of production of fissile material would be the trigger if I was going to be triggered. Your final case is Pakistan, and you worry most about that. Why? I do. Pakistan um, combines uh, much of the of uh, the ingredients, many of the ingredients that we worry about when we think about fissile material getting in the hands of terrorists. Uh, Pakistan is a, a country in which uh, 
the Islamic religion is important and which there is an array of uh, adherence with various varying degrees of what one would call radical interpretations of Islam. So we have some of the ideological base for terrorism in Pakistan. We are certain that Pakistani terrorists have been responsible for pretty horrendous acts against India. So there are active groups within Pakistan and this sympathy for terrorists in Pakistan it's, it can be a dangerous place. It is also a place that has been pursuing a nuclear weapon since the 1970s, right after the Indians tested their device in 1974. Sometime in the 1980s, they probably um, had enough fissile material producing highly enriched uranium at a plant, which was uh, designed essentially, centrifuges designed by AQ Khan. And uh, through the 90s, uh, they developed their nuclear weapons program. They tested in the late 90s. They have, through the last decade, uh, been very busy developing plutonium as well. They have been building um, a variety of delivery systems. Um, they soon uh, will have sufficient material, a sufficient number of delivery systems, a sufficient number of weapons that you will not count them the eighth or ninth country. They will overtake other countries to, among the original first five mm. in terms of their weapons establishment. None of the material, none of the weapons are secured to the standards that we would find acceptable. There's a risk of theft, uh, leakage. Uh, I don't believe that the civilian authorities would ever agree to the transfer. I'm not worried about that. But when I say leakage or theft, this is not something that you can deter in the normal sense of a country attacking another country. This is not like the Iranian case in which we say if we could attribute the transfer by Iran or attribute the transfer by North Korea, we will treat you as the attacker so you might be able to create some deterrence. This is not like that. It's as if material were to leak out of Russia where there's a lot of material. I mean that's, uh, again, we would not assume that a Putin government would authorize such a thing, but uh, maybe in, in some location where the material wasn't adequately secured, it might be stolen. Similarly, in Pakistan, but I, I think with a higher probability, the material could be gotten, and maybe even the weapons. And we can't go very far down the discussion of what they would do with a weapon because it gets to how the weapon is secured against unauthorized use. But there's a concern there, too. One of the few places on the planet where I would have a concern about fabricated weapons going missing. So I find the Pakistani case very, very challenging. They don't trust us. They see what we did to find and kill Osama bin Laden, the kind of raid which they fear we would make on their nuclear assets, which they regard as absolutely essential to offset the asymmetric conventional advantage that India has over Pakistan. So given their image of India as a threat, given the terrorists present, given their embrace of nuclear weapons, delivery systems, huge production facility for fissile material, this is a real threat to international security and I think particularly to our security. On that note, uh, Bob, thank you for taking the time to, uh, for this discussion. We really appreciate it. Harry, thanks very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.